Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So, um, our lab is then very focused on Neanderthals. And as you will know, Neanderthals are this extinct group of humans that existed in Europe and Western Asia and disappeared around 40,000 years ago. And you may ask, why should we be interested in Neanderthals? And I think, to me, the major reason is that the Neanderthals are our closest evolutionary relatives to all present-day humans. So if you want, if you want to sort of define ourselves as a species or as a group, it's really them we should compare ourselves to and say what's unique to us compared to Neanderthals. And our approach to this has been to study their genome, and this goes back now 30 years in the meantime, developing techniques to retrieve DNA from bones such as these. And now, two years ago, we were finally far enough to have, for the first time, a high-quality Neanderthal genome, where every position to which we can map short DNA fragments that are preserved in these bones are covered on average 50 times over. And we have happened to not only study Neanderthals, we also stumbled across an even smaller bone that was found in southern Siberia a few years ago. We sequenced a high-quality genome of that one, too, and it turned out to be a distant relative of Neanderthals that we called Denisovans after this site it was found. So if we summarize what we sort of know about uh, our closest relatives, if we then say that the deepest divergence among human populations today go back around 100,000 years, Somewhere six times further back in time is there a common ancestor shared with Neanderthals and Denisovans, and they in turn are sort of around 400,000 years back maybe. So one thing that came out of the study of these old genomes was that it turned out that when modern humans came out of Africa a bit after 100,000 years ago, they actually mixed with Neanderthals. Uh, at least a few times for Neanderthals and also once at least in the Far East for Denisovans. As a result, if your roots are from Europe or Asia, around one or two percent of your genome comes from Neanderthals. And these different people generally carry different sort of fragments. So something like 40 percent of the Neanderthal genome or a bit more is still walking around on two legs today, so to say. So there's a lot of studies coming out these days then from GWA studies, medical conditions, where one finds associations between alleles contributed by Neanderthals and different diseases. But what we are most interested on in the framework uh, of uh, what is funded from the, or was founded from the Allen Foundation, was in a sense what is not contributed by Neanderthals to modern humans. So you can now go over the genome and plot the frequency of contributions from Neanderthals in Europe and Asia, and then ask for regions where you statistically would expect to see contributions from Neanderthals, but you don't see it. Uh, and those regions might then be interesting because there we seem to sort of select against the contribution from Neanderthals, as if something important was hiding there. But those, some of those may be by chance, just regions lacking this. But what we then did over the past few years was to look not only on this contribution from Neanderthals, but go out together with Josh Ake in Seattle and sequence people from Papua New Guinea that then has also contribution from these Denisovans to look for regions that twice over, so to say, resisted this contribution from other human forms. So you can then look across a chromosome like this and find regions where neither Denisovans nor Neanderthals were allowed to contribute something. And those regions we then think might be very important because there might be some basis for modern human-specific functions lying there. And those functions may then be things such as rapid technological development, for example, that start with modern humans. Neanderthals stone tools at the beginning of their history and end of their history over 400,000 years look pretty much the same, at least to a non-expert. But modern human technology, of course, changes very rapidly. 
figurative art comes with modern humans. Only modern humans start expanding in size and becoming not the hundreds of thousands, but millions of people spread across open water and colonize the whole world and so on. So a dream then would be that we could understand some of that by looking at genetic changes that we all share or almost everybody share today, but Neanderthals and Denisovans don't have it. And with the high quality genome now, we can make such a catalog of these changes. And they are in the order of 30,000 changes in the genome. But again, these parts of the genome are two-thirds where we can map our things. So what we started out with was saying, well, maybe these fixations and that have happened are just random events in the genome and have no function. So we started out by just looking at a couple of things that look like regulatory changes looking at 25 transcription factor binding sites, comparing then the 25 pairs of the ancestral and the derived versions in a reporter assay, testing them in three different neuronal derived cell lines. And actually 12 of those 25 turned out to have a significant difference in this assay. So that seemed quite en encouraging. At least some of these seems to do something. Given that this is a rather unnatural reporter assay, just tested three cell lines, and so on. We've also begun to look at the amino acid changes that we have here. There are only 96 fixed amino acid changes. We begin to have some results about that. Just one example of this. This is an enzyme here with an amino acid change. It's an enzyme in purine metabolism. When you have a deficiency in humans of this enzyme, you have psychomotor retardation and autism and some other neuronal uh, problems. This amino acid change is not in the active site of the enzyme, but very close to it. So when we engineered this change into a mouse and tested for activity of this enzyme in different tissues and at different ages of the mice, it does actually have quite a dramatic effect, no matter what tissue we look at, what age group, we have lower activity in the humanized form of this enzyme. We think we know what this derives from. If we express the enzyme, there's no difference in Vmax or things like that, but in stability of the enzyme here. So of course our interest now is to look at the phenotypic effects of this, particularly in behavior, so we're beginning to do that. We're encouraged by previous work we did on the transcription factor in uh, FOXP2 that's involved in speech and language, where we a few years ago put in two amino acid changes that distinguishes humans and Neanderthals from the apes in this. And this actually results in changes in corticobasal ganglion circuits and enhances certain forms of motor learning in, in the mouse. But what we want to do is, of course, not just randomly go through this list from the top to the end, but to, to prioritize and say what changes might be most important. So one way to do this is to look in these archaic deserts, as I said, where we seem to resist integration from, from archaic forms. Another one is to look for positive selection in humans since we separated from Neanderthals looking for things that seems to have been advantageous to modern human ancestors. The problem with that is that Neanderthals are so closely related to us that for at least 90% of the genome they fall inside our variation, so to say. Meaning that some person in this room is more closely related for a certain part of the genome with Neanderthals than other people in the room. So for 10% about that is not the case. It goes back, we all go back to a common ancestor and Neanderthals fall outside. Again, that may be due to chance, many such things. But if it's due to selection, and we imagine then that something changed in modern humans since we separated from Neanderthals that was positively selected, swept through to everybody, if that then happens fast enough, it drags with it a rather long region around it in the genome that may they indicate positive selection. So what we've done over the past two years is design a hidden marker model approach to identify unexpectedly long segments where the Neanderthals fall outside. So we can go over the genome 
and identify putatively, positively selected things that were selected sometime during the last half million years. So if you just take this now and say, where are the genes in those regions expressed in their body more than we would expect by chance? The only tissue that stands out turned out to be the brain. And if we look for functional enrichments of things in the genes uh, encoded in these regions, there tend to be membrane proteins and actually synaptic proteins. So that looks um, quite interesting. So the third approach we're then taking to try to prioritize these things is to say, let's look at genes that have to do with functions that we think might be important in, in human, recent human evolution. And Chris's talk was an excellent introduction to this because I do think that autism spectrum disorders is a very good example of that. They affect sort of aspects of socialization and communication that several people have argued may be traits unique to humans. So we've been involved in a study with two other groups to study gene expression in the prefrontal cortex across life in individuals with autism and in controls to find the trajectory of expression sort of uh, across life. So if you do that, you can then identify, in this set of individuals, you could identify six groups of genes where the trajectory differ between individuals with autism here, say, where these genes tend to increase their expression across life and be stable in controls and so on. So if we then ask for these six groups of genes, does any of them have an overrepresentation of SNPs that have been associated with autism in GWAS studies? One of these groups stand out, the second group here, suggesting that then some genes here might be causally involved, perhaps. So if we ask what types of genes are encoded in these different groups in this group that we then are most interested in, it's again trans synaptic transmission and, and ion transporters. Our special input into this project was to study gene expression across life, comparing humans with chimpanzees and macaques, so a monkey, asking them for gene, which genes differ in their expression in a human-specific way, whether apes and monkeys are similar to each other and humans differ. And if we then ask in which of these six groups of genes we looked at previously, is there an overrepresentation of human-specific ex expression patterns across ontogeny? It's again the second group here. So you can see that then if you plot this sort of in this uh, group of synaptic genes and the controls tend to have a peak uh, around 12 years of age and then the, these genes go down in expression. People with autism, it decreases across life and the monkeys and apes look more similar to that sort of peak around two years of age or so. We can then ask how many of these genes overlap with those positively selected things in our positive selection screen, and there are 16 genes there. It's not quite significant enrichment, but still, those are then perhaps particularly interesting to study. So how will we then study them? We obviously then need model systems. One such model system are transgenic mice, as I already mentioned. The other model system is then iPS cells that you can differentiate into different cell types in 2D cultures and also in 3D cultures. In terms of the brain then, sort of these brain organoids where you have neuronal uh, development from stem cells organized in an epithelium much as in fetal tissue. And we have used single cell gene expression to then compare gene expression first in fetal human tissue with organoid tissue. We can then order the cells from these progenitors to neurons. And if we overlap what we find among the cells from the fetal tissue with organoid tissue, we find the organoid tissue uh, cells all across this pathway, suggesting that this is a good model to study neuronal differentiation. 
We then do organoids also from the apes, compare the ape organoids and human organoids. Overall, they look very similar, but there are some differences you can discover. So for example, if you would time-lapse uh, for, uh, photography, look at the apical progenitors here and how they divide through um, uh, mitosis. Surprisingly, you find that in the humans, the metaphase here is much longer when you have this metaphase plate. It's significantly longer than in the chimpanzees and also in the orangs and compared to the mice. And this is specific for these neuronal stem cells. You don't see it in other chimpanzee cells we compare with corresponding human cells. So that is quite striking. And it actually took us back to our catalog of changes we see then. Because if we look in this list of protein changes uh, that are fixed in humans since Neanderthals, these 87 genes, three of them are directly involved in the spindle and the kinetochore. And not only that, among these 87 genes, there's only one that has three amino acid changes, that's, and that's one of these. There are only four with two amino acid changes, and again, one of them this year, and that one is only a single one. So this looks quite striking then that we have all these changes here. So obviously what we now want to do is to put these into our model systems. So that will then be editing IPS cells, making these organoids, studying this uh, metaphase length. Also put them into the mouse and study the same things in the developing mouse brain. And another sort of line of work in the lab has been to try to make CRISPR-Cas9 editing in iPS cells more efficient so that we could imagine putting in many changes on top of each other or even simultaneously. And in the best instantiations of this, we now come up to about 50% accurate knock-in editing in iPS cells. So I think we now have a toolbox available to study the human phenotype, if you like, computationally, in that we have a catalog of all these modern human-specific changes, thanks to the high-quality archaic genomes. By sequencing people in the Papua New Guinea, we have then defined these deserts that have resisted twice in human history, integration from other uh, forms of humans. And we have this robust positive selection screen that is probably rather robust in what we find, but we probably have a, quite a lot of false negatives, I should also say, we, we recognize. And laboratory-wise, then, we have humanized and neanderthalized mice that one would do, efficient editing in stem cells that one could then sort of study in particular 3D cultures. I should say many, many people are involved in this, too many to uh, mention. I will mention the groups that we work with, particularly then the single cell genomics group led by Barbara Troitlein in our institute. For the gene expression in a, uh, during ontogeny, Philip Kaitovich and his group in, in Shanghai and in Moscow. And for the cell biology of the organoids and metaphase length, particularly Felipe Mora Bermudez here at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. And that was. Uh, Question. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No question. So in addition to, to looking at brain related um, explanations, I mean, things like sterility uh, or immune related stuff might have been other things I would have expected might pop up. Is there any evidence that? Those relate to the deserts? Mm -hmm. So, immune genes don't stand out at all in, in the deserts. It's, it's really from the, it's again, what, what seems to stand out are actually uh, also a lot of genes involved in dendritic outgrowth, axonal guidance stand out. Immune genes are actually quite a lot that have come over from Neanderthals and affect the immune response in, in humans. I see. Yeah. Oh. 
so how about, I mean, one of the obvious things that differs Neanderthal from modern humans is their morphology. And of course, a lot's been done about that. Um, do you have any indication from the genes you've looked at mm -hmm. that might be responsible for modern morphological differences in humans compared mm -hmm. to Neanderthals? Yes, there, there is sort of some genes. There's ranks two, for example, that has to do with cladiocranial dysplasia and is mutated. That has a sort of phenotype that could sort of be related to this that is in the desert. There are two studies in the world on, on going on where people try to associate now Neanderthal introgressed alleles with cranial morphology that you get from fMRI as a side project in the studies. I think we will find genes involved in that probably from introgression. It doesn't seem to stand out as something in the deserts that you resist getting over. I had a question there. You said there were 3,000 regulatory changes. Were those generally um, single nucleotide changes or small indels, or were there, or do you also see, you know, insertion of what looked like it might be a new enhancer or, or a line element or something like that? We have not looked at insertions in any. These are really point mutations of small two, three base pairs indels. Yeah. We have big insertions with problems mapping it, actually. That's what I thought, it. but I was yes. hoping with the better genome so that might be Yes. Yeah. I mean, one should probably work harder on that. But it's a big, we have a sort of an average size of 40 base pairs pieces, so we right, sort yeah. of do run into problems. If we know about the polymorphism in the human, we can look for the junction fragment. Yeah. But the totally unexpected things is really hard for us. Yeah. Okay, thank you.